Professor Rendsburg and Professor Isak, as well as uh, the colleagues from the University of Johannesburg and the other universities present, Chairperson and CEO of the IDC, Deputy Minister Masuku, Mr. Bobby Godsell of Business Leadership South Africa and the distinguished delegation of business leaders who are here today, Mr. Zdumot Lamini, the President of Kusatu, and the representatives of its affiliates, as well as of NACTU and of FEDUSA, and the UJ Council member, who moonlights as the General Secretary of the National Union of Mine Workers, Franz Baleni. <laughs> Delegates from government, Judge President of the Labour Appeal Court, Distinguished Symposium members, friends. Today is Africa Day. When I, as an African, look at the state of my continent, I, and I suspect many in the audience, see much to be optimistic about. The reasons for my optimism ranges from the deepening democracy that we see on the continent, the intolerance for military coups, growing economies. At some point, Africa had five of the 10 fastest growing economies globally. And the evidence, although uneven, of a growing determination that we must steer our own future, that in spite of the deep and damaging legacies of colonialism, it is our responsibility our responsibility to improve the lives of citizens on this continent that we call home. Africa is the birthplace of humanity and is blessed with enormous natural resources and a youthful population. <coughs> if the complex reality of 52 political units that are the nation states bequeathed to us by the map makers from Vienna, Paris, and London can be harnessed for inclusive growth <coughs> and for development. Then with its natural beauty, the vitality, the resilience, and the humanity of the people of this continent, then our continent can feed its people, contribute to the knowledge base of humanity, and use science, technology, social mobilization, and good governance to promote social justice and to make this not only the cradle of humankind but the best home of humanity. Why would you want to go and live in the UK when you can live on the African continent? Africa Day is an opportunity to reflect on how best we achieve the vision for the continent that has been articulated so eloquently by thinkers, leaders, writers from the 1950s. And at the heart of our efforts lie a few basic concepts, good governance, development, integration. But recently we saw a wave of xenophobic violence, and anger directed in some South African townships against migrants, migrants mainly from elsewhere on the continent. It struck me as I visited factories and engaged with community members that there were two discourses taking place. Please and you. On the one hand, and I won't enter my PIN number. <laughs> on the one hand, many workers, young people, and unemployed citizens had real fears fears about competition for jobs, for ownership of shops, for access to housing. These were aggravated by the perception that crime, particularly the drug trade, was connected to networks of migrants or foreigners. The simple answer to the frustrations was, send back the foreigners or we will. So that's the one discourse. On the other hand, 
Many public commentators pointed to the spirit of Ubuntu, the role played by African countries in our liberation struggle, as the rebuttal to that xenophobia and the fears. Now I want to suggest that it is right that the fundamental argument against xenophobia, particularly against fellow Africans, must be on the assertion of our common humanity and the need for solidarity among Africans. But for those who are poor and desperate, these arguments may not resonate when bread must be put on the table. They are comfortable argument for those who have. <clears throat> Migration is a global reality as wide e income e inequalities and economic disparities between countries clash with the political boundaries in which citizens live. And as people move to where opportunity is, it's happening in the EU, it's happening in the United States, China, Australia, South Africa, it's a global phenomenon. Nor is migration solely a product, of course, of this age of globalization as economies integrate. Indeed, African history is in part shaped by the large movements of people. In fact, the first large wave of Africans that left this continent populated the rest of uh, the globe. So humanity's history has been shaped by those first movements of Africans out of the continent. But movements within the continent that preceded the colonial era shaped so much of the early kingdoms, the early trade and development of this continent. We cannot unscramble ourselves as a nation, nor can or should we in the long run build societies constrained simply by the reality of today's national political boundaries. That pan-African vision is the one that we seek to realize. But indeed, if economic integration of which migration is an element, as economic benefits for South Africans too, that it is not only an act of solidarity, but also a source of economic development, then the argument must be made more clearly. Not only within the elite of politics and academia, but also within communities and workplaces, schools, and the many social institutions through which ordinary South Africans organize their daily religious, economic, and social activities. I believe, therefore, that it is vital that we also make the economic argument for how South Africans benefit from our economic links with the rest of the continent. Why a narrow xenophobia endangers those benefits and in any event shows how sustained, unsustainable it is to seek to disengage economically from our continent. The benefits of economic integration are real. Research that we commissioned shows that 244,000 direct jobs in South Africa are sustained by what we sell to the rest of the African continent. The jobs impact is indeed higher because a worker who makes cars that are sold elsewhere on the continent also buys bread that is baked locally, pays rates that keep municipal workers employed, pays taxi fares. Indeed, it is estimated that the direct and indirect jobs impact of exports to the rest of the continent, as well as the multiplier effect of these exports, can be as much as 885,000 jobs in South Africa. Talking of cars, the Ford Ranger Bucky is manufactured in Roslyn, in Pretoria. One out of five of those Ford Ranger Buckies are in fact sold to the rest of the continent helping to create decent job opportunities here in Gauteng. I recently shared with parliamentarians a few snippets, just examples of the value of economic integration. The largest export market for South African manufactured plastic products, and they're pervasive everywhere you look, you see products that have plastic in them, is Zimbabwe. 
the biggest market export market for televisions that are assembled and made in South Africa is Zambia. The biggest market for clothing that we sell outside our own borders is Mozambique. Each of these export markets for these South African made products are bigger than Germany, China, the United States. We import a large quantity of water used in Gauteng. So if I'm going to have this glass of water now, as I intend to do, <laughs> half of this water comes from Lesotho. So half of the water consumed by households and industry in Gauteng is in fact imported from a neighboring country. And it's good water. <laughs> we import gas that drives South Africa's biggest industrial company, SASO. We import that gas from Mozambique. Yet, yes, uh, it's true that our neighbors benefit too from this exchange of goods and products from infrastructure, but so do we. And xenophobic sentiment so often is not based on a true understanding of how the South African economy, how South African workers, how South African communities benefit from this wide integration process. And so if that is the case, then xenophobia threatens our economic prosperity. Many in parliament, in academia, business and government will know this. We need to have a dialogue that goes beyond only the leadership of key institutions. The reality is that if we benefit from being part of Africans' economic story, we must have a wider consciousness among all South Africans, or else there's a danger of a consensus of the elite and a growing anger by communities at the perceived or real impact of economic integration and migration. Of course, we need to do much more than simply tell the story better. Regional economic development is important so that as Zimbabwe and the Democratic Republic of Congo and Mozambique grows and there are more job opportunities in each of the countries, those who desire a better life are not always obliged to cross a national border in pursuit of it. We need to promote this through concluding the free trade uh, area discussions that would bring together 26 countries, 600 million consumers, and provide the economies of scale in our trade and industrial relationships. We need to do this through fostering regional skills development programs and by implementing coordinated industrial strategy in the region. We need better governance across the continent so that wealth is equitably shared and economies are well managed. And we need active steps here in South Africa to create jobs, to industrialize the country, to expand infrastructure to all communities. And this is part of, and it's at the heart of government's effort over the last five years, so often against the headwinds of global economic developments. As we map out our growth path, our development plan, since October 2010, just to give you an example of it, when Cabinet adopted the new growth path, 1.7 million new job opportunities were created in South Africa. Over the past half a decade, we've lifted the rate of infrastructure investment to the highest level yet, spending just over a trillion rand. A trillion rand that goes into schools and universities, clinics and hospitals, dams and water pipelines, power stations and transmission lines, roads and the inner city transport that is so frustrating today because pavements and roads are being dug up, but we're laying the basis for integrated transport. Rail lines and locomotives, port facilities and airports, houses and solar water heating systems. We're now focusing on producing more of the taxis, the buses, the condenser units and other components here in South Africa. A Youth Employment Accord has been signed to step up efforts to provide economic opportunities to young people. And funding has been made available to facilitate the growth of black industrialists. Competition policy too has been used to prize open markets, to combat uh, collusion. 
But these issues, important as they are, will be explored at length in other discussions and processes. We brought together an unusually talented group of South Africans and visitors to South Africa today. We have members of parliament, academics from three universities, representatives from organized labor in South Africa and Nigeria, business leaders based here in South Africa as well as elsewhere on the continent, community delegates and officials from development finance institutions, government departments, representatives of the Labour Appeal Court, researchers, public commentators. So the core of today's symposium is really a conversation, a dialogue that we want to have. And what we seek to get from this talented group of people is to share ideas on how best we take the storyline of how fundamental economic integration is today on African Day and share that, dialogue that with communities. Make this part of the discussion in taxis, in townships, in spaza shops, in shabins, in schools, in churches, in municipal council chambers, in civic structures. How to take our messages and communicate them to a wider audience. And it's not solely a question of what must government do differently. Although good advice and good ideas will be extremely valuable and welcome. It's about what each constituency does. The IEDC, for example, has an extensive investment portfolio in the rest of the continent. It's doing good work there. Backing cement factories, port facilities, the rollout of broadband, the development of airports elsewhere on the continent. What must it do beyond its investment to tell the story of how those investments also benefit South Africans? How what we do there is good for the country and good for the continent? The university has an outstanding group of researchers. This university, WITS, UCT, and the others that are part of the symposium. beyond academics sharing information with each other. What responsibility and practical steps can they take to share that more widely? Businesses trade through the markets that are elsewhere on the continent. So you sell goods, and that's important, and it creates jobs here. How many of the workers in those companies know that their livelihoods are in part dependent on our interdependent continent. <coughs> Trade unions organize workers. How many migrant workers are unionized now? And how well do we take on the important leadership challenge of telling the story of African integration in factory, mine, and shop meetings? And so I can go through all of the different constituents. I think we have people here of <coughs> like view. How do we take these views, the insights, the ideas, and share more widely? Professor Rensberg, that really is what I hope we can achieve today. And really, those are just a few preliminary remarks to the deep, rich discussion that I anticipate, the concrete ideas that we know will flow from this, the commitments that we know will come out of that. And may I also welcome the team from Cape Town who is joining us, and I see on the screen uh, Dr. Survey of the Independent Group uh, sitting there. And once again, thank you for all of you to come here today, and I look forward to a rich and good discussion. Thank you very much. The University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.